this he, because of his cancer he had the last year. Uh, this guy keep coming all the way down here. Uh, he had to rearrange some things on the schedule, so he's been gone quite a few weeks from uh, Lydia Springs, and uh, he didn't want to burn the congregation there, so he asked me to go he didn't stay for this morning, so I told him that I would work to get his, uh, his to take his place. Now, uh, as we begin this morning, this material comes from uh, four different sources. Uh, this is not in the book, so we won't have copies of this. And, uh, this material is, is uh, from a periodical called Reflections uh, by Al Mackey. I don't necessarily recommend that to you, but he did an article in which he researched the uh, Sunday school and anti-Sunday school effort. And then there is a uh, article by Wayne Jackson where he talks about the anti-Sunday school work. And so I've used these two references and a couple others I'll give to you in a few moments. What we need to realize is, and some people say, well, I don't even understand what atheism is. Well, I, I can relate to that because I was preaching over in Mississippi, and uh, I've never been called liberal in my life. And... A lady came to visit with us, and she saw that we had a place for fellowship. She saw that we supported Orphan's Home, and, and as I was visiting with her and talking to her, she'd been coming came two or three weeks, and, and we're talking about whether or not she was going to be worshiping with us, and she said, well, uh, I come from a conservative congregation, and, and y'all are so liberal. And I had no idea what she was talking about. She said, well, you know, we support Orphan's Homes, and you have uh, a kitchen and a fellowship area. And so I began then to have my eyes open to what this idea of antiism really is. And this weekend, that's what we've been trying to do is to look at this subject, hopefully not being rude to anyone, but talking about finding where God is not bound. Now, there are brethren in the church today who would say that because we're in this building this morning and we're about to do what we're doing is, is Bible study, that we are condemned to hell simply for being in this situation. And you say, well, no, surely nobody thinks that. Well, they do. But let's give a little background first about Sunday school in particular. Now, you know, most of us have grown up going to Sunday school all our lives. Never thought about anything being wrong with it. <clears throat> well, Sunday school, actually, the idea of Sunday school, it was called Sabbath school to start with, but it, they did meet on Sunday. It started in the 18th century. You have to understand the conditions of the world at that time. Uh, what we would call sweatshops existed in Europe, and they were children who, in order to help their parents survive, to, to make a living, were having to work 12-hour days in factories. And I'm talking about small children. Sunday was the only day that they didn't have to work, and because of that, they were gathering up and and they were getting into mischief, as children have been known to do. And some of them, because of their ways of getting into mischief on this day off, uh, they continued doing that through their life. And as they got older, they became criminals and were going into the prison system. Well, there was a gentleman by the name of Robert Rinkes who saw the deplorable conditions the children were living in. He saw the terrible prison conditions. And looking at the two things, he determined that something needed to be done about this. And so he began to work with another individual to try to bring some kind of, uh, some kind of stability to these children's lives on Sunday morning. Now these children realized working 12-hour days, six days a week, had no education. And so originally the idea was to gather these children together and to not only teach them some Bible, but also to teach them some things like reading, writing, and arithmetic. And so, as he started this, and he got a little help from different ones, the idea began to catch on that this was an idea that would work. And so, an enticement to the children, clean clothes were offered, learning materials were provided, and instruction given in the, in the three things we talked about. And Jerry Tanner, in an article entitled A Brief History of Sunday School, wrote this. 
He said the church's hope that this effort would serve to a dual purpose of bettering the future of society and curbing the rampant delinquency that was going on. Though neither evangelism nor religious training were the expressed goals of the new schools, there was hope that the morally taught, the morality taught, being based on the truths of the scripture, might bring about a transformation in the hearts of the children, and so the Sabbath, or Sunday school, was born. And in the 1800s, the goal became, because of the denominations, the goal became to use the Sunday school as a way of increasing the... Um, increasing the numbers in the denominations. And so they saw this as an evangelistic tool and they began to use this. Now, something like this doesn't go on in private, so it began to spread the idea of that. And then in the uh, 1800s, uh, around 1824, the effort of Sunday school came to the United States. And again, the idea was to organize, to evangelize, and to civilize. Well, <laughs> Following the uh, beginning of the Sunday school effort here in the United States, the idea began to catch on with more and more with the different denominations, and so the Sunday school uh, idea became something that was just taken as for granted. But as you might expect, anything that comes up, any new concept that comes up, there's always been an element of fierce opposition that comes up from someone. And the Sunday school was no different. <clears throat> now, one of the brothers mentioned yesterday something that's important for us to remember. We had the restoration movement going on both in Europe and in the United States. Now, in the restoration movement, there was the Stone and Campbell forces, and these were some of the leading men of, of getting the church started. Some of these individuals were so skeptical of anything different, and, and they had a reason to be. They came out of groups that, uh, the denominational groups that had different ideas than what the church actually stands for. And so they were afraid that if the Sunday school idea caught on, if this was something that people tried to do in the church, instead of it being a tool to help increase the knowledge of individuals, they saw this as a way that the, that the denominational way of doing things could creep back into the church, and so they opposed it. Now, in 1830, a Baptist association in the state of Illinois, and when I say these, these things, understand, if you've not studied about the Restoration Movement, as they were coming, uh, and Campbell put it this way, coming from, from darkness into light, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he said, as they were coming out of those things for a while, they were doing certain things that the church ought to be doing, but they were still hanging on to some of those denominational feelings and some of those denominational terminology. And so as they were coming through that era and changing, they were beginning to see, and they were dropping off things as they went. They'd study more, they'd see this was wrong, and they'd change the way they were doing things. In 1830, the Baptist Association of the State of Illinois passed a resolution which said in part, we as an association do not hesitate to say that we declare an unfellowship with the foreign and domestic mission and Bible societies, Sunday schools, and all other missionary uh, institutions. A many good, of the many, good many of the Baptist churches in the Midwest at that time adopted this anti-mission society, anti-Sunday school position. There was, um, they had become independent efforts to do the work of the Lord. This was, this was what they were afraid they were going to do. Now, if you've ever studied about the Missionary Society, and I think Brother Crow mentioned it yesterday, the Missionary Society seemed like a good idea. And a lot of times good ideas come up in the church, but we need to go back to the Bible and see if this is what's actually the case. The work of the church, one of the works of the church is evangelism, and the church is supposed to be done through the church. The Missionary Society was a different entity altogether. And they determined they would gather in all of a, a bunch of missionaries, like Brother Grubb sitting here. They would take him, and they would have him work for them. But it wasn't the church doing this. It was the missionary society. And they would send him out to different places. And you say, well, he's evangelizing. Yes, but you see, they had taken over a work of the church, separating themselves from the church, as it were. And, and this was wrong. 
And so the individual saw the Sunday school doing the same thing. So separating, a, as we do in here, in the different classes, well, actually, in the beginning, they didn't separate into age groups. Uh, this was something I was telling Brother Grubb. I, I started reading a debate that was held in, in 1924. Uh, excuse me, 1824. I'm not sure of that date. You know how my mind is now. Probably 1924. It was. Thank you. Thank you, John. Keep me straight. Uh, between a man named Warlick and Phillips. And I got engrossed in reading that because... Uh, in some ways it was almost comical, in some ways it was so confusing because the fellow who was taking the anti-Sunday uh, idea would say something in one paragraph, contradict himself in the second paragraph. But anyway, so you can see why these, these congregations of the church were so leery of, of Sunday school because they didn't want it to become like the missionary society. And so, um, in the Church of the Cross, most of the anti-Sunday school congregations uh, have also divided themselves over an issue, uh, other issues. And we talked about some of these yesterday. We're going to continue talking about some of them today. But in this article, and this was from uh, Mackey's uh, uh, paper, The Reflections, he said, many of them are, are one-cup advocates regarding the use of multiple cups. I found it interesting. Well, it was funny. Yesterday we had a visitor with us. And uh, afterwards, he said, you mean people would actually believe in just using one cup to take the Lord's Supper? And I said, yes. He said, do you know how sick you can get by doing that? And I said, yeah, I do. I always want to be on the front row and get it first. And after that, you will do what you want. But uh, he said, I just can't believe that. Well, people still believe that today. So anyway, many are, are one cup advocates regarding the use of multiple cups as being apostate and bound for hell. Now again, we're not trying to be rude or unkind to anyone in what we're talking about here. But sometimes common sense has to play into what you're doing. And telling me that we're going to hell because of that tray of multiple cups here isn't even reasonable. Brother Vaughn is going to talk to us today about the one cup issue, and, and I hope you'll be here and listen to what he says about that, um, because you'll find out the one cup used in when the Lord was instituting the Lord's Supper, at that supper there could have been up to four different cups. And uh, nobody ever researches the words. That, that's one of the problems of all this, is really looking into the words and seeing what the words actually mean. And the other thing is opinions. And opinions want to be law. I, I'll give you a, a for instance. Uh, a few years ago, uh, this is kind of off my topic, but a few years ago, we had a problem with men coming to the Lord's table with clothes that seemed inappropriate to some of our older members. We had people coming up here in shorts. We had shirts that had different kind of signs on them. And so in the men's meeting, it was discussed. And it was determined that we needed to do something about that. Well, uh, I usually wear a coat and tie and a jacket, or pants too, but uh, a suit. Uh, that, that's what I believe. When I come to worship God, when I come to study God, I don't think I need to dress like I'm going to a football game. I, I just don't believe that. I'm not raised that way. And you may do it that way. I'm not binding what I wear on you at all. But I'm just telling how I feel about it. If I went to my mom's funeral, this is the way I dress. I came to worship God. I'm going to dress as good as I did for my mom or better. It's just the way I feel about it. Well, the men decided that we would make a rule that if you're going to wait on the Lord's table, you had to wear at least a collared shirt, a decent pair of slacks, and dress shoes. And I saw all their faces, and I saw how excited they were about this. And they just knew that I'd be voting yes on this. And it got to me and said, well, I oppose that. And they, I could see some of them, what are you talking about, Riley? You dress in a suit and tie. Why do you oppose this? I said, because we can't make a law God didn't make. God has not said a law that says I have to come to worship him dressed like I'm dressed or in a certain way. I think we can suggest that as the men of the congregation, as a congregation. But we can't make it a law because God didn't make a law. And so we had the suggestion that we wished 
or we would ask the men to dress appropriately to be a part of worship. You see, we could have gone on and done that, and I know congregations where there is a rule that you have to wear a coat and tie or you can't wait on the Lord's table. Well, that's a, that's a rule God didn't make. Now, it can be suggested, but it's saying somebody's going to be lost or it's sinful to do that, that's going beyond. That's binding where God has them bound. Back to my lesson. Um, I found this quite interesting. Uh, I didn't realize this actually happened, but it says, uh, Brother uh, Mackey says, these factions have further divided themselves regarding when and how the bread will be broken during the Lord's Supper. And when I read that, I did remember that. From the early 60s, I remember there were some congregations that thought the men had to break the bread up here before they said the prayer. Or it was unscriptural. And I see some of these faces like, what in the world is he talking about? <clears throat> these were issues that were, were important to some people at that time. Some feel that it should be broken before the prayer by one administering the meal. And normally in those cases, there'd be one fellow who stood here the whole time. And there'd be two, uh, four fellows who passed out the, uh, passed it around to the individuals in the congregation. And that one person was supposed to break the bread before he said the prayer. Because if you read there, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, uh, they could say, well, this is how it's supposed to be done. Well, others feel it should be broken after, uh, after the prayer. Thus, we have the bread breakers and the bread pinchers. And we have the wine only and the grape juice only. Now, I remember this one. There was a time in the church where if it wasn't truly wine that they made themselves, by the way, illegally, <laughs> then it couldn't be used on the Lord's table. <laughs> well, it says fruit of the vine, and so they were making a law that God didn't make. The one cup issue versus the multi cup issue groups, and on and on. And so there are many things that came up during this time. In the early days of the Restoration Movement, many opposed the Sunday school uh, idea. The Stone Campbell uh, Movement, as I talked about earlier, uh, was largely opposed to that group. Now, I want to move on. Uh, I can't give you all this information. I gave you the references so that you can, can look this up. There was one thing that uh, I did want to point out. Uh, some of the churches of Christ who took the exception to the idea of having the Bible school for the simple reason you can't find Bible school in the Bible. Well, Brother Acuff in his paper and then in that debate that I was reading, or am reading, and in Brother, Brother uh, Jackson's uh, article, talked about the fact that as you study through the Bible, you find different times where teaching was done, but it wasn't in an assembly where they'd come together to worship God. So what did they have? Well, they had class. When Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, what was he doing? He was studying with the language. Uh, when Jesus was on, uh, taught us what we call the Sermon on the Mount, well, there was in indications there that, that basically this could have been a classroom situation. Now, we think about is Sunday school in the Bible. Well, the word Sunday school is not in the Bible. Uh, find the word prayer in the Bible. Find uh, the, I don't know, any other number of words that we understand are part of what we do, and they're scriptural to do them because the Bible, by inference, teaches those things, and sometimes by example. We have the example of, of teaching being done uh, as we go through the New Testament. You know, I can't get to all of those passages this morning, but if you, they, they would say if you can't show a little chapter and verse where it shows the word Sunday school, then we, then we shouldn't do it. Well, now let's think about that. The problem that comes together is taken from 1 Corinthians, uh, where Paul, I, I don't have the passage before me right this second, uh, where Paul talked about the congregation <coughs> came together. Okay, Paul was in the city of Corinth for approximately 18 months. Now, I dare say Paul was a little bit evangelistic, wouldn't you? And the congregation in, in Corinth grew. Well, when they came together, and he was discussing there when they came together to take the Lord's Supper. We discussed that yesterday, how they were mixing it with the love feast, Lord's Supper with the love feast. 
when they came together, the congregation there, it's possible, was probably too big to meet at any one time. Now let's let's take let's take the congregation here. We run anywhere from 70 to 100 most every Sunday. Whose home would we want to open up to have worship in? Whose home is big enough? Well, I dare say none of our homes are big enough to facilitate what we need to do. And so we came together as a group and we built this building. Now, is this building holy? No, it's not. This building is brick and mortar. It's paint, it's nails, all those things put together. Now, we've come here this morning and we're going to worship God. We're going to have a worship service at uh, uh, 1030. Now, when we come together to worship God, we all come together in the same place. And that's what the Bible teaches. But we've decided as a group, and we could do this or not, there's no law that says we have to meet and have Bible study. It's not there. But as a group of individual Christians, we came together and the men of the congregation determined that we would come an hour before worship and study God's Word. Now, the problem with the anti-Sunday school group is they say that any time the congregation comes together, it should be to worship. Well, let's think about that. So any time we get together, we get together to worship. Well, what if we go, let's just say we rent a uh, building, I don't know where there is one around here, to just have a fellowship together, but the whole congregation comes together. Are we worshiping? Well, no, we're not worshiping. We've come together this morning to study the Bible together, to better ourselves, and it's expediency. I want to get over to, uh, to Brother Jackson's uh, thoughts on this because he had some great, great ideas uh, and teaching. He says, the question we are asked today is it scriptural to separate into different groups mostly divided by to teach the Bible. And now here's another problem that came up with the Sunday school group, or the anti-Sunday school group. For a while it seemed that they were okay with coming together as, as a group and studying the Bible. And this is just some of them. And you have to understand this. When you're talking about atheism, you'll have a group here who may not eat in the building, who may not support orphans home, who may not have Sunday school, and you'll have a group over here that lead in the building, and they'll support, they might support an orphan's home, it's doubtful, but they might, but they won't divide up into age groups. Now there's a congregation not too far from here, uh, I'm not even sure which direction it is now, I think it's that way, but they don't believe in having classes so they're anti-Sunday school. Well now some of you have children. And your children, you want to learn the Bible. Now you visit around in the area and you come to us and we have Sunday school and we have great teachers. And you see your children learning the Bible. But then you go there and there's no Sunday school. Well, then you decide to go worship with us and not them because you want your children to learn the Bible. Well, what they found out in this area, at least, was their numbers were beginning to fall. And so they decided they'd fix that. And so now, they don't have Sunday school at the building. They meet in people's homes and have classes. Now, they'll have small groups all across the community teaching people the Bible. But they still won't have Sunday school at the building itself. Do we see the, the fallacy of what they're doing? They're having Bible study. It's just in the homes. And one of the things they tried to, to bring up or did bring up was the fact that parents should be teaching their children in the home. I admit to that. But they thought that's the only place it ought to occur. So when the congregation came together, it was just to worship. So the children ought to be taught at home by their parents. Well, what the people who believe, we believe is, not only do we need to be studying at home, but we can come together. We have facilities here. Let's study the Bible before we come in here and worship. And think about that for a moment. What better way to get ready to worship God than to study God's Word for an hour or so, 35 minutes, before you come to worship God? But you see that? No, no, we can't do that. Well, Brother Jackson said, the question we're asked with today is it scriptural to separate in different groups. 
Those who oppose doing this have refused fellowship with Christians who have Bible classes, and that's a fact. Uh, we had a lady who worshipped with us for several years, and when she first came to us, uh, I talked to her, and she had been coming for a while to see if she was going to worship with us, and she said, well, I've been withdrawn from her. So I questioned her. I said, well, what, what, let's talk about it. And so she showed me the letter she was withdrawn from because she visited with us one time on a Sunday and worshiped with us. And because of that, the congregation withdrew from her because they're the only scriptural congregation they believe in the entire area. Now, you talk about radical. That, that's radical. We accepted her into the fold here as our sister in Christ, and we wrote a letter to the congregation who withdrew from her, letting them know that, and asked them if they wished to discuss this with us, that we'd be glad to do it. We never heard from her. Brother Jackson wrote, No one in this writer's knowledge has ever contended that the church absolutely must teach by means of the class arrangement. And that's true. There's no law in God's Word that says we have to meet an hour before in order to have Bible study. It's just not there. But as he said, I've never heard of any, anyone who would say that that's a law, that we have to do that. As far as it being scriptural or unscriptural, it's scriptural to study God's Word, but we can't bind that you have to meet. Now, when I first came to Richmond Hill, I can't recall whose funeral it was, but Brother Lewis and myself were asked to sing. I think Brother Jeff was asked to sing at a funeral. And when we got there, the preacher at that time, at the, uh, uh, I want to say Rickon, but that's not the right congregation. Anyway, he was going to be singing with us, and I knew he was anti, and they had no Sunday school. And so we were sitting there, and, and I, I just, I had to ask him, I said, well, I said, I'm not sure I understand. Could you explain to me why y'all don't have Sunday school? And he said, well, Riley, it's like this. He said, we as a group decided that we didn't want to have Sunday school, and we don't believe it's scriptural, but we're not going to buy that on you. If you want to have Sunday school, go ahead, but we chose not to. Well, now, I can't argue with him on that. Now, I, I think it's unwise, but he wasn't binding. They weren't binding the fact that you had to have or didn't have to have Sunday school. But you see, most anti-Sunday school people don't hold to that idea. Uh, Brother Jackson continued in his, in his article talking about, uh, I think it was six things that we need to look at. First of all, there's expediency. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Now, he says those who hold the anti-Sunday school, and I like how he put this, uh, the anti-Sunday school believe have a failure to understand the difference between specific and generic law. Now you say, well, I, I don't know if I understand that either. Well, specific law is divinely imposed obligation. That's something God says, this is the way you do it. When we worship this morning, we're going to take the, the Lord's Supper. That's the fruit of the vine, and that's the, the unleavened bread. That's specific. God told us that's what we got to do. But generically, he didn't say how we partake of it. Well, he, he told us to take of it in a worthy manner, but that's not what I'm talking about. He didn't tell us whether we had to have one cup or a hundred cups. He didn't tell us if we had to have individual pieces of bread or just one piece of bread. And so that's allowed our liberty to determine how we're going to do that. Uh, another example, we're told in Mark 16, 15 to go preach the gospel to every creature. But that's a specific thing. We can't add to the gospel. We can't take away from it. That's specific. But how are we going to do it? Brother Grubb, in just a few moments, is going to talk about radio and television. God didn't tell us to use radio. He didn't tell us to use television. He didn't tell us to use the Internet. He didn't tell us to use the newspaper or bulletins. He left that up to us. But the gospel is to be spread. And so there are specific and generic laws. Now let's move on just a little bit. He moves on to his next point. And that is uh, in the one place. Uh, when Paul mentions 1 Corinthians 11.20 and 14.23, he says they came together in one place. But again, the idea we talked about earlier. The Jerusalem church, when it began to grow, there were possibly 
the number of saints that has been estimated, probably 10,000, at least 10,000 saints there from the day of Pentecost. And the church began to grow, and it's highly unlikely they had accommodations anywhere where they could all meet together in, in order to worship God or to come together to study God's Word. Uh, in consideration of these facts, he said it must be acknowledged that this church was required either to segment into smaller congregations or else folks could not assemble unless they had a facility with a room large enough in which the whole church could come together. In those two uh, Corinthian texts, the issue addressed dealt with the congregational procedure, and that's what Paul was talking about there. He wasn't talking about they had to be in the same room together. But the anti-Sunday school brethren say, well, we can't, we can't split up the congregation because we all have to come together. Well, we come together to worship, yes. Uh, now, this is something that I oppose, and uh, I had to, I was in a congregation not too many months ago, worshiping, and as worship began, the man making announcements 